Let's try to think about action in the way that many philosophers do, starting with this question. What distinguishes your actions from things that merely happen to you? You wake up feeling a bit drowsy and stagger out of your bedroom, trip and fall down a flight of stairs, tumbling as you go. At this time, your flatmates with the famous Buster Keaton, who's seeing you perform this marvellous stunt, not realising that this was no action of yours at all, but something that merely happened to you, the falling of your body down the stairs. Buster immediately has a brilliant idea and follows your example, replicating rather precisely the movements that you made. What distinguishes the things that happen to you, like just merely falling down the stairs, from things that are actually constituents of your life, the things that you do, your actions, like, for example, making a cup of coffee, say. This is called, by many philosophers, the problem of action. Now, of course, I've got two issues with this. So one is that I don't think it's the only problem. So it's quite strange to call it the problem of action. Uh, if you're following along with these lectures, you've seen already one other question about action. and Indeed, there are many more. Uh, so I don't think it's helpful to talk about the problem of action as if there was just one. Very little justification for that. Now, the next thing we face, though, is the question, well, is this really a problem? Is this really a problem? Steve, what is a problem? I'm glad you asked. A problem is a question that's difficult to answer. A problem is a question that's difficult to answer. Now, you might think this isn't a difficult question to answer at all. You might think, for example, that we can answer this question by appeal to some kind of kinematic features of actions. And indeed, very often, if you're observing people, you can see the difference between things that are their actions and things that merely happen to them just by looking at the kinematic features. You can see the carefully controlled way in which I reach for and grasp that coffee cup in front of you, taking out of your way. You can be sure that it's no accident that I've removed the coffee cup from you. Too much coffee for you this morning. But the example of Buster Keaton imitating your stunt indicates that it's possible for there to be cases which are perhaps kinematically indistinguishable, where one is something that merely happens to you, you falling down the stairs, and another is an action in an agent's life, Buster imitating you as part of a stunt. Another thought we might have is so we can answer this question just by people's sort of coordination, right? Action involves some kind of coordination of body parts. But again, it seems unlikely that that will work, and there's a link in the notes if you want to go further there. So I think when it comes to problem, I agree that we do have a problem of action here. This is a question which is difficult to answer. But we do have a standard answer. The standard answer, very widely accepted in philosophy, is that actions are those events which stand in an appropriate causal relation to an intention. Now there are various attempts to refine and elaborate on this answer, but I think it's fair to say that a great deal of philosophy is driven by the assumption that this answer is correct at core. So it should be something of great interest to us. The other thing to note here is that it's an instance of something even more general and even more widely accepted. This is the so-called causal theory of action, according to which an action is an event just in case it has certain sort of psychological cause. So you can see here that this is a more general statement, certain sort of psychological cause, and then the standard answer that cause is in particular an intention. So really the question for the philosophers mainly in philosophy of action has been, well, what are intentions uh, and what is this appropriate causal relation? What's the appropriate causal relation? How to characterise that? Uh, there has been little debate about whether the causal theory and the standard answer are actually correct. So one thing we might wonder is, well, you know, how did anybody arrive at the standard answer? How did anybody arrive at the standard answer? And I think the standard answer is most famously associated with a paper by Donald Davidson from 1971 called Agency that you'll see cited below. So let's just try to retrace the steps that Davidson takes to reach the standard answer. The first thing that Davidson notes is very interesting. It's possible to describe an action in many different ways. Uh, so to borrow his example, you move your finger, thereby pressing a light switch, thereby turning some lights on, thereby alerting a prowler. Right? It'd be more if I was better at this kind of thing, I'd, I'd actually have all of that happening. It'd be more dramatic, wouldn't it? Right. Okay, so I've moved my finger, turned the light switch on, uh, uh, turned the switch, turned the lights on, alerted a prowler. And these are, of course, four ways of describing a single action, right? I didn't do four different things there. There was just one thing that I did, 
which had all of these effects. And the action, of course, could be described in terms of its effects. Very good so far. Second thought is this. The way that we describe an action can, but need not relate to your intentions. So in my case, pressing the switch, that's something that was definitely intended by me. So if we describe the action, Steve pressed the switch, that relates clearly to my intentions. By contrast, Steve alerted the prowler. I had no knowledge that the prowler was there, so that was very far from anything I intended, and I was quite surprised that I achieved that. So we can describe the same action, one of the same action in one way that relates to my intentions, pressing the switch, for example, and in another way, alerting the prowler doesn't relate to my intentions at all. And I'm sure that you can think of many similar examples here where you have one action that can be redescribed in many different ways, some of which relate to your intentions and some of which are very far from your intentions. Okay, so that's some helpful background. Now with that in mind, Davidson goes on to give us a threefold distinction among causes of uh, an action. In this case, he's talking about spilling the coffee. I don't know why he's spilling coffee, but he, he is spilling coffee, right? So he's woken up, he's not feeling very good, he's reaching for a cup, and he forms an intention to spill the coffee, uh, and indeed he does spill the coffee, right? Perhaps he doesn't like it, perhaps you have given him a, you know, a not very nice cup of coffee, and he wants to subtly uh, get rid of the coffee without offending you. Now clearly in this case, this would of course count as an action. Another possibility is this. Davidson grabs the cup which is actually coffee but falsely believes it's tea. He forms an intention to spill the tea, as he thinks of it, uh, and so jiggles the cup and does spill the coffee. Now in this case again I take it that spilling the coffee is an action of Davidson's. It's just something that we have described when we say spilling the coffee in a way that doesn't relate to any intention of his. Now, the third thing that happens to Davidson is that um, I seize his hand, right, and I just jiggle his hand around, poor lad, he's, he's woken up, he's having breakfast, he reaches for the coffee, and I just grab his hand and wave it around, and he spills coffee everywhere. And of course, in this case, it's true to say that Davidson spilled the coffee, right, um, but it wasn't his action, it wasn't his action. If anybody acted here, it was me. Okay, so we have a threefold distinction here. Now, we want to reflect on the different components here. So the first thing is, if we think about two, we can be sure that we shouldn't say that an event is an action just in case for every description of that event there is a corresponding intention. Right? That, that clearly is something that we, we cannot say. Because Davidson, the event in question here, is spilling the coffee, but the only intention Davidson has is spill the tea. He's got no idea that it's coffee at all. So we can't think that there's a very tight connection between intentions and actions. The second thing Davidson takes from this threefold distinction is a question. Right? What's the distinction between cases like two and cases like three? Right? One involves action, one involves non-action, but how do those two things distinguish? And what Davidson suggests is something very simple. He suggests that the distinction here is that the second is intentional under some description, whereas the third is not. Right? So in the second case, if we describe the action of spilling the coffee, it's not intentional under that description. But if we describe the action as uh, tipping the liquid out of the cup, it is probably intentional under that description. Or there'll be some other thing, like twisting the wrist. And that will be the same action, and that will be intentional. So Davidson's suggestion is, when there is a description under which the action is intentional, as in two, it's an action. When there is no such description, it's not an action. All right, now, how does that get us to the standard answer? Good question. Suppose we add one tiny further assumption. The tiny further assumption is that for an action to be intentional under a description, it must be appropriately caused by an intention. If we make that assumption, then we can get to the standard answer. For an event to be an action, as opposed to something that really happens to you, it must be appropriately caused by an intention of yours. So where are we now? Well, we've just been looking at a second question, a question that really informs many of the philosophical discussions of action. What distinguishes your actions from things that merely happen to you? And we've arrived at the standard solution. We've considered Davidson's steps towards reaching the standard solution. This is why he's, he's got there to the standard solution. But I want to note that this isn't the first question we asked. So earlier we asked the question, in a previous section of this lecture, what's the relation between an instrumental action and an outcome to which it's directed? What's that relation? And there we saw once again that there is a standard answer involving intention. The standard answer was that the 
outcome to which an instrumental action is directed is the outcome specified by an intention which caused it. Very simple. Now what you notice here is that intention comes in in both cases. The questions are different, but they admit of comparable answers, both of which involve intention. Okay, very simple observation, nothing deep there. Here's the interesting question or issue that we now need to face. With respect to the standard answer here, we noted that the existence of habitual processes forces to refine or even to reject the standard answer. And I'm eventually going to argue for reject here. I think the standard answer is just the wrong way to answer this question altogether. And the existence of habitual processes and some other considerations show us that the standard answer is wrong. It's not obvious that anything straightforwardly carries over to the second question, the so-called problem of action. So the issue that we now face, that I'm going to leave with you for this week is, although we'll come back to it in the future, uh, the issue now is, well, is the existence of habitual processes in some way or other a problem for the standard solution to the problem of action? And if it is, well, why is it? What exactly is the problem that habitual processes might create that might force us to revise or even reject the standard solution to the problem of action.